to politics. Tom is the New York Times bestselling four-time Project Censored award-winning author of, I think it's 25 books, but I hope I'll be forgiven if I'm off by a couple. His book, Attention Deficit or Disorder, A Different Perception, published back in 1993, sparked a national debate on ADD, ADHD, and neurological difference. The Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight, The Fate of the World and What We Can Do Before It's Too Late, it was published in 1998 and inspired Leonardo DiCaprio's film, The Eleventh Hour. In 2010, Tom re published Rebooting the American Dream, 11 Ways to Rebuild Our Country, a book that so inspired Bernie Sanders that he read from it extensively on the floor of the Senate. Tom now has a hidden history series. It includes 11 paramount and timely books breaking down the obstacles um, uh, today, uh, obstacles facing today's society, placing them both in historical context and providing real tangible calls to action for individuals and society at large. Recent entries in the series include 2018's The Hidden History of Guns and the Second Amendment, 2019's The Hidden History of the Supreme Court and the Betrayal of America, and 2020's The Hidden History of Monopolies, How Big Business Destroyed the American Dream, which was the occasion of his last visit to Town Hall, virtually at least, about six months ago. The latest entry in the series is The Hidden History of American Oligarchy, Reclaiming Our Democracy from the Working Class, and it's the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming back Tom Hartman. Thank you, Ware. It's, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be back with Town Hall Seattle. It's, uh, it's such a great venue, and I'm so pleased to be here. And thank you for the, for the great in introduction and, and your kind words. Uh, thanks to Sh Shane and Josh and, and the folks at uh, Elliott Bay Books who are also uh, on this, and everybody at, at Town Hall Seattle who are working to make this work, happen and work. Um, oligarchy, the, the reason why I started writing this book, um, uh, which you know, I began writing it about a year, year and a year and a half ago. And it was that I've been watching this trend through uh, the last 30, 30 to 40 years of my life and uh, with growing alarm. And the Trump presidency just really brought it into sharp relief. And I felt like, you know, somebody needs to lay out how we got here, what the probable outcomes are, what the dangers are. And what we can do about it, and uh, you know, so thus uh, the, the the hidden history of American oligarchy. Um, first, some definitions. Oligarchy. You know, the last time I was here, we were talking about monopoly. Monopoly is when a small number of actors, corporations typically, end up dominating a marketplace, and and thus pushing out competition. Oligarchy is like the political equivalent of that. It's where a small number of actors, typically very wealthy individuals, because wealth can translate into political power quite easily. It's a very fluid relationship. A small number of very powerful political actors seize control of the political marketplace, as it were, and turn it to their own benefit, and very often as a consequence of that, to the detriment of everyone else. Uh, it, it, a, a literal definition, well, maybe not literal, but you know, a, another way of defining oligarchy would be to say that it's when government ceases to work for the people and exclusively works for the very, very wealthy or for the, for the oligarchs who basically own and control the, the political space. And that's where we're at right now. That, and, and there's a reason why this is so dangerous. Oligarchies are inherently unstable, and I'll explain that in just a second. And, and they tend to flip in one of two directions, and we'll get to that also. But how do we know that we're in an oligarchy right now? Probably the best uh, uh, analysis that's been done was uh, by two researchers, Benjamin Page and Matthew Gillens. Uh, they published their work back in 2014. I believe that they were with Princeton and Northwestern universities, uh, as I recall, it's all in the book. And uh, they, they were looking at, and, and by the way, they're not unique in having done this. There have been a number of subsequent studies and there were a few smaller ones that weren't as well circulated prior to their work. Um, so you know, we can look at this more generally than just through the lens of this one study. But basically what they were looking at was, what's the relationship? between what the majority of people want and what gets turned into legislation, into law or public policy. Because that's the definition of democracy, demos, the people, right? What the people want is what the people get. And 
when they looked at the period before the Reagan revolution, prior to 1980, what they found was that what the majority of people wanted frequently got translated into policy, very frequently. There was a clear correlation between public opinion polling that showed strong public support for particular issues and those issues and that, you know, those issues being converted into law. And that's how we got Medicare and Medicaid and the, and the minimum wage. Well, that was in the 30s, long-term unemployment payments, um, uh, food stamps, uh, housing support, uh, a whole a variety of Pell Grant type college supports, um, how we got brand new schools all across the United States, brand new hospitals built all across the United States, the Eisenhower Highway System of connecting the United States, new, new airports. I mean, it, I, it, you know, you could probably complete the list or, or add to the list as well as, as I could. There's literally hundreds of programs that you can date back to the 1950s, 60s, and 70s in particular, some, many of them to the 1930s and 40s as well, that because of popular demand got turned into policy. After the Reagan revolution, they looked at the same relationship between what the majority of people wanted and what actually happened. And what they found was that that correlation was completely broken. By 2000, the relationship between what people wanted in public opinion polls, and in some cases strongly wanted, and what we got was, uh, to quote their study, you know, the statistical equivalent of random noise, of white noise. But what the top 1% wanted consistently got translated into public policy. You know, for example, the, the one major, really the only significant legislative accomplishment of the last four years of the Trump administration was a $2 trillion tax cut that principally benefited billionaires and big corporations. So what comes out of oligarchy in a situation like this, and, and, and this I believe is why we had uh, Donald Trump as president among other, along with all these other faux populists, you know, like uh, Ted Cruz talking about, we love the working man. And, and that kind of stuff, is that the people st start looking around going, you know, hey, you know, I, I, I don't think that, you know, we'd like to, we'd like to have a national health care system like every other developed country in the world does, uh, you know, get with the program. Uh, you know, why do we have to have student debt in the United States? Literally no other developed country in the world has student debt. In Denmark, they pay you $400 a month to go to college, <laughs> you know, and it's free. Um, why can't we have nice stuff, basically? Or, you know, why, and, and, you know, seniors, you know, why are they constantly, you know, why does the Social Security increase go so slowly that people, seniors are sliding into poverty? Why is 20% of Medicare have to come from private companies? Why is it that in 2005, George Bush rolled out this new scam program called Medicare Advantage that now is, is doing serious damage to Medicare itself? and is endangering the seniors who've signed up for it because it's just private insurance and they can kick you off and they can deny coverage and, and they routinely do. Um, you don't have the protections that you have with Medicare. Why is that? Why is that happening? And so somebody comes along like Donald Trump who, who frankly stole parts of Bernie's platform. Donald Trump, you'll recall, campaigned on, I'm gonna raise taxes on billionaires. Remember he said, I'm, you know, these, these, my friends are going to hate me. I'm going to get, I'm going to get killed with this tax increase. I'm going to get, uh, he said, we're going to give everybody in the country medical, medical care, and it's going to cost a hell of a lot less than Obamacare. Remember that? We're going to bring back the jobs. We're going to reverse the NAFTA and GATT and, and uh, WTO free trade policies that were negotiated by the Reagan administration, uh, turned into treaties by the Bush administration, the first Bush administration and signed into law by the Clinton administration, we're gonna reverse all that stuff. And, and, and the 60, 65,000 factories that have gone overseas in the last 20, 30 years, they're all gonna come back home. That's what, he, that's what he sold people. And because people knew that government wasn't working for them, when somebody comes along and says, you know how the game is rigged, it's a pretty seductive call. So that's another indicator that we're in an oligarchy. Oligarchies are very vulnerable to, to uh, BS populism, to 
fraudulent populism. Bernie Sanders' populism was a genuine populism, the kind that Franklin Roosevelt, uh, you know, rode to victory because he actually did what he said he was going to do, and it was actually what people wanted. Uh, Donald Trump's obviously was a phony populism, as is that of you know his wannabe successors, people like Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz and Tom Cotton. So. The reason why oligarchy is so dangerous is because as the people are increasingly cranked up over the fact that they know they're not getting what they want out of government, and they're protesting and they're writing letters to the editor and they're calling the members of Congress and they're, they're showing up at the occasional town hall meeting that, that, that you know, and, and demanding things and just nothing is happening. The, the nature of the government typically flips in one of two directions. Either, it, either the government fights back the oligarchy, which has happened twice in the history of the United States. I'll get to that in just a second. Or the government, the oligarchs get together and say, we're not gonna let go of this. We're gonna hang on to this oligarchy. We're gonna continue converting the wealth of this country into our own wealth. And these people who are protesting out here, we're gonna create a police state to control them. And that's what you're seeing right now in Belarus, in Russia, in, um, uh, in, in uh, Hungary, in Poland. It's happening uh, in Brazil. It's happening in the Philippines under Duterte. We're seeing countries that were democracies, even if only for a relatively short period of time, um, some of them long-term democracies, that have become oligarchies. And then when the oligarchy was challenged, instead of flipping back to become, being a democracy, they instead flipped into becoming police states. And we almost did that here in the last 60 days. That would have been, there's no doubt in my mind that had Donald Trump succeeded in overthrowing the election and was today the president, that you know, within a year, a lot of people like me would be in jail because that's typically the first thing that, that oligarchies do when they become police states. They start imprisoning journalists and, and you'll recall, Donald Trump waged a war on the press for four years. They started imprisoning journalists and opinion writers. They, they imprisoned opposition politicians. Look at Navalny in, in Russia right now. I mean, this, this is just how they do it. They brutally crack down on people. So that's why the stakes are so high right now and why I thought it was so important to have this book, uh, to write this book. And I'm, I'm so glad that the book is out right now because we're literally on a knife's edge. If Joe Biden and the Democrats cannot successfully demonstrate to the people of the United States that they can make government work for the people again, like it did prior to 1980, prior to the Reagan revolution. If they cannot demonstrate that, then we're gonna see this whole situation get much, much worse, which is why I've been begging people to call Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema and any of the other democratic senators who want to keep the filibuster so that Mitch McConnell can destroy any kind of legislation that the Democrats propose. If on the other hand, you know, through, through good luck, good fortune, or a miracle, uh, President Biden and, and, the, and the House and Senate can actually pass legislation that's more than just a, here, you know, here's 1400 bucks, now, now shut up and go away, but instead real systemic change. If we can wipe out student debt, if we can produce a national health care system, these are things that have like 70, 80, 90% popularity among the people. Stop banks from ripping people off, um, raise the minimum wage substantially, build, build an economy that works for everybody put this country back together in a meaningful way, get rid of the potholes, you know, that kind of stuff. If they can do that, then there's a very good chance that they'll be able to fight back the oligarchs. So to put this in a historical context, the, you know, our first battle with oligarchy, of course, was the American Revolution. A monarchy is simply one form of oligarchy, only it's, a, it's an oligarchy where instead of a group of wealthy people basically running the show, you have one family that is at least the figurehead for the oligarchs. And we fought a revolution against that in 1776. The second confrontation we had with oligarchy, oligarchy or the first internal confrontation we had with oligarchy in the United States 
happened as a result of a technological innovation. In 1798, a fellow by the name of Eli Whitney invented a machine called the cotton gin. Now, in the South, cotton was the principal product. Cotton actually produced more wealth for the United States from the, from the early 1700s through the mid to late 1800s than any, anything else we did. It was such a major export and so much of it flowed out of the port of New York and so much of the money went through the banks of New York that when the Confederate States uh, seceded from the Union and declared war on, on the Northern part of America on the Union, the mayor of New York City publicly suggested that New York City should join them. That's how, you know, there was a hell of a lot of money at stake. here. So the bottleneck in making money on cotton and producing large quantities of cotton was cleaning the seeds out of the cotton. The, the bowls of cotton, uh, you know, little wads of cotton that grow as, the, as essentially the, the, the remnant of the flower of the cotton plant. Um, have embedded in them these fairly substantial uh, seeds that the, that the cotton fibers are glued to, essentially. And it, it's an enormously difficult job to pick those seeds out of that cotton. So what Eli Whitney invented was this machine that had, it was like a drum with a screen all the way around it and little hooks, long, long wires of the hook on the end, would go through those screens, grab a strand of cotton, pull it out, and the, the seeds couldn't get through the screen, and so they were stuck inside. And you, you crank this thing, and it would do this thing. And, and what was amazing was that this machine was able to do the work of 50 enslaved people, one machine. And so the larger plantations in the South who had the resources, Eli Whitney charged a lot of money for these machines, the larger plantations were able to buy cotton gins. And as a consequence of this, they could increase their cotton production 50 fold. And they wiped out their small competitors. And, and in the process of wiping out their small competitors, they bought up the land of, the, of all these small farms around them, turned in many cases, the former owners of those small cotton farms into essentially sharecroppers and, and uh, or, or uh, you know, employees living on, on what used to be their own land. And as economic power consolidated, this, the cotton gin, as I said, was invented just you know, two years before 1800, but it really hit the marketplace in a big way around 1815. And so by 1830, this consolidation in the South was well underway. And it, on, in every single one of the cotton producing Southern states, uh, which was the majority of them, what we saw was the, the large plantations getting bigger and bigger and bigger, these families getting richer and richer and richer, and all of them turning their eye to politics. They took over their state governments. They were already running a police state. In my first book on the hidden history of guns in the Second Amendment, the Second Amendment was written the way it was written to protect the slave patrols in Virginia and South Carolina which and Georgia, which were the militias of the day. And so they already had a, a police state infrastructure and the South had become a rigidified oligarchy. And they were very upset about the fact that there was still this democracy, a very loud, noisy democracy going on north of the Mason-Dixon line. And it was infecting people in the South. Um, it, it was causing rebellions. It was causing discontent um, you know, across the board among enslaved people and among the poor white people who had been pushed off their farms and, and uh, or lost their farms and, and had become, you know, the employees of, the, of this oligarchy. And so they essentially declared war on us, said, we don't want a democracy in North America. We're going to take you down. And they nearly succeeded. You know, six, 700,000 people died. But we fought them back, we beat them back, and we defeated them. And we then broke up those giant plantations. Uh, one of the largest in Louisiana, Parchment, is now the Louisiana State Prison. The, uh, one of the largest in Virginia was that of Robert E. Lee's. Robert E. Lee's plantation is now known as Arlington Memorial Cemetery. So we put the, we put the oligarchs basically back in a box. Then another technological innovation brought about our second confrontation with oligarchy in the United States, which reached ahead in 1933. 
But the second confrontation with oligarchy really began in the 1880s, 1890s with the railroad and steel and oil and, and coal and, and uh, just all of these industrial dynamite chemicals, uh, all these industrial processes that produced a new generation of oligarchs, the Carnegie's and the Rockefeller's and the Morgan's and the, and, uh, you know, the Astor's and on it went, you know. Uh, and those oligarchs started getting very politically active, reaching out for control of not just individual states, but the nation as a whole. There was a blip in uh, right after 1901 when McKinley was assassinated and his vice president, Teddy Roosevelt became president. Roosevelt was a progressive and he tried to take on the oligarchs with the Tillman Act in 1907 that forbade corporate sponsorship of candidates for political office and by breaking up the big monopolies, a job that was actually uh, the, the breaking up of Standard Oil was completed by his successor, another progressive Republican, uh, President Taft. But that kind of fell apart with World War I and, uh, and then in 1920, an explicitly, an explicit embrace of oligarchy uh, was the campaign slogan of Warren Harding. Warren Harding campaigned on basically two things. His first slogan was called a return to normalcy. The top income tax rate at that point in time, the top bracket was 91%. It was a remnant of World War I. And Harding said, we're gonna drop that down to 25%, which he did when he was elected. His second campaign slogan was more business in government, less government in business. In other words, privatize, deregulate. And he did. And that kicked off the roaring 20s when the average working person's wages went down and the very rich got explosively rich. So much so that they created this teetering edifice of money that crashed in 1929 which opened the space for Franklin Roosevelt to come in in the election of 1932 and directly take on the oligarchs. The oligarchs were not pleased with this. And in fact, a group of, of businessmen, it's called the Businessmen's Conspiracy, a group of wealthy oligarchs pulled together, uh, got, you know, put together a, a, a deal with a very, very right-wing, uh, virtually Nazi, um, uh, veterans organization, veterans from World War I and the Spanish-American War. They had over 100,000 volunteers. They were going to march on the White House and kidnap or kill Franklin Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, and put in and install as president a good Republican. The mistake they made was going to the most famous general in America at the time, Smedley Butler. He's a Marine general. He was the most decorated man in the history of the American, or the in then modern history of the American military. He was the hero of World War I, a hero of the Spanish American War. And uh, he blew the whistle on them and shut that thing down, which led to Franklin Roosevelt in his 1936 speech, uh, his acceptance speech to Philadelphia in, in, in uh, I believe it was August of 1936. Um, saying, you know, the, these economic royalists need to be overthrown. He, he literally were, used the word overthrow. We need to overthrow this, this, this emerging monarchy, essentially. My, my word, not his. It's an absolutely brilliant speech. I encourage you to, to look up and read FDR's 1936 acceptance speech. It's mind boggling because he calls these people out over and over and over again in that speech and declares war on them. And he did go to war with them and he put them back into a bomb. And they stayed there until the 1980s by and large. And what we saw out of that was the fastest growth of the middle class in the history of America. We had never seen a middle class grow in nowhere in the world, actually in the history of the world. We had never seen a middle class grow that fast. The modern oligarchy that we're fighting came out of that. And where it started, arguably, was in 1951. A fellow by the name of Russell Kirk wrote a book called The Conservative Mind. And this is the book that kicked off the modern conservative movement. And in The Conservative, in the, in the conservative Mind, Kirk posited, he, he, he went back to the, the debate between Hobbes and Locke in the 1600s. Hobbes had published Leviathan in 1651, the, the book that famously said that, you know, man's original state, in, in man's original state, life would be nasty, brutish, and short. Um, but Hobbes also posited that 
we could govern ourselves. Um, Locke, the next generation, uh, Hobbes was the tutor to King Charles I uh, as a child. Locke was the tutor to King James I as a child. Um, Locke, about 30 years later in the, in the 1670s, published the second treatise on government. And he said, Hobbes is wrong. The, the essential nature of humans is not evil, it's good. And therefore it's even easier for us to govern ourselves. We can even more easily govern ourselves. And uh, that, and, and along with the writings of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was more of a, an anthropologist, he was looking at the reports that were coming in now to, to Europe from explorers who were visiting North Africa and West, and West Africa and the East Coast of, the, of the North America and you know, Central and Northern South America. And what they were finding were Aboriginal and Indigenous people who were actually living a pretty good life in many cases and didn't have warfare. I mean, Ben Franklin summed it up when he brought 34 members of the Iroquois Confederacy to the opening day of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787 and gave this speech where he said, it would be an extraordinary thing if five nations of ignorant savages have been able to forge a, a union that has, that has uh, remained, that has, that has been an in, indissolvable bond of peace for a thousand years and 13 colonies of educated Englishmen can't do the same. So Rousseau was writing about this and, and uh, it, it, you know, this idea that people could govern themselves, that we didn't need a monarchy, we didn't need a lineage, we didn't need the oligarchs, really caught fire in the minds of the people who founded this republic. So anyhow, uh, Russell Kirk goes, goes back to the beginning and basically takes Hobbes's side of the argument, the conservative side of the argument, that people are evil. And, and Kirk predicts in 1951 that this growing middle-class phenomena that America was then witnessing. And at that point in time, we were the fastest growing largest middle-class ever seen on earth. It was a brand new thing. He said, if this continues, if average people being unreliable as they are, being greedy as they are, being pickpockets and thieves and, and, and shoplifters given a chance as they are, if average people continue to get wealthier and wealthier and wealthier, and keep in mind in 1951, the top 5% were getting rich more slowly than the bottom 90%. The bottom 90% were growing both in wealth and in income faster than the top 5%. And it stayed that way right up until the, the end of the 1970s, the early 1980s. So anyhow, Kirk says, if that happens, it's going to be the end of American society. Now he really believed this and these conservatives really believed this. And so you could, you could argue that this is, you know, the, 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 the tragedy of good intentions, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. But Kirk said that basically if the middle class got wealthy enough, what you would see is that young people would stop respecting their elders, that women would no longer know their place, that racial minorities would start demanding equality with white people, that, and, and, and basically that all hell would break loose as a consequence of this, and that, and that working people would no longer respect their bosses, their, their, their betters. And you know, when he published the book, it had a following among the intelligentsia. This was the book that really you know, awakened Barry Goldwater and William F. Buckley Jr. I, you know, I remember as a kid in the 1950s, the late 1950s, early 1960s, sitting with my dad and watching William F. Buckley on TV, you know, talk about this stuff. But it, nobody really took it seriously in the United States. I mean, it was talked about academically until around 1963. In 1961, the birth control pill was legalized. By 1963, the birth control, control pill was in widespread use. And it kicked off the women's movement. Women could now control their reproduction, uh, their, you know, their potential for reproduction, and started demanding an equal place in the, in the marketplace, in the job market. Um, by 1965, you had the beginnings of the psychedelic movement and young people starting to, by 1966 and 67, certainly pushing back against the war in Vietnam, saying, hell no, I won't go. You had a civil rights movement led by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and others that was big and visible 
and scary to a lot of these white conservatives. And by 1967, 68, 69, you had cities that were on fire as a result of this. You had women, quote, burning bras. You had young people burning draft cards. You had union workers going on strike in record numbers. And at that point, the conservatives in the Republican Party and some of them in the Democratic Party looked back at Russell Kirk's writing and said, my God, he's right. We've got to strip back the wealth of this middle class or this country is going to become a hellhole. And, and so the uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, Eugene Sindor, the director of the Cha US Chamber of Commerce uh, talked with his friend and neighbor, uh, Lewis Powell, a, a tobacco lawyer in Virginia and said, uh, give us an outline, what should we do? How do we deal with this? We don't want our society to collapse. We're loyal Americans. We wanna have a safe country. What do we do? And Lewis Powell outlined it. He said, okay, you know, we've got to seize control of all these systems that have kind of fallen apart. We've got to get, we've got to get our people in the university so that we can start teaching young people a good conservative worldview in the political science and economics departments. We've got to take over the political space. We've got to, we've got to pack the courts. We've, you know, we've got to, we've got to control the textbooks in the schools. We, you know, and, and he just went through this long list that we've got to have our friends buy up the media and consolidate the media. Um, he laid out a blueprint for a conservative takeover of America in 1971. The next year, Richard Nixon put him on the Supreme Court, Lewis Paul. And over the next couple of years, some very, very wealthy people, uh, in particular people who had been previously, like Fred Koch, had previously been funding the John Birch Society, started funding programs like the Heritage Foundation, the Cato Institute, um, the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Um, every single state has a, you know, the state policy network, every single state has, a, has their own right-wing think tank in it that would turn out material for the newspapers, op-eds. Um, you know, just Google any topic that's controversial right now. And the top 20 hits that you're gonna get are gonna be things that either came out of a right-wing think tank or were published in a newspaper or magazine by somebody who was a graduate of a right-wing think tank. I mean, they, it, it, they've had tremendous influence. And then Reagan came into power. And Reagan's number one mandate, and, and oh, well, actually there's one, one more piece to the story. In 1976, the Supreme Court, Lewis Powell now on the court, the Supreme Court changed the rules of the game. After the Nixon bribery scandals of 73, 74, we passed a lot of good government legislation limiting the influence of money in politics. It was done under Jerry Ford's administration by and large, but it was good stuff. And so in 76, Lewis Powell and the Supreme Court looked at these laws and they said, you know, if a individual billionaire wants to own a politician, wants to be the principal patron of a politician, the only source for that politician. And that politician wants to do whatever that billionaire wants in terms of producing legislation and voting. We used to call that corruption. We used to call that, in fact, bribery. But we're not going to call it that anymore because what we're going to say is that money is not money. Giving money to a politician, that's not bribery. That's not money. That is speech. And so when a billionaire owns a politician, he's exercising his right of free speech, which is protected by the First Amendment. And then two years later, in another decision that Lewis Powell actually wrote called First National Bank versus Bilotti, the Supreme Court extended that logic to corporations because, you know, corporations are people too, you know. This opened a floodgate of cash. Now, the Democratic Party really didn't have much interest in all this corporate and billionaire cash that was flooding into the political system because they were really well funded by the unions. Keep in mind, at that point in time, a third of Americans had a good union job and they were paying union dues. And so working people were funding the Democratic Party through their unions. The unions were so awash in cash that a few corrupt union leaders, Frank Fitzsimmons, Jimmy Hoffa, were able to skim money off the top. In fact, Jimmy Hoffa skimmed a million bucks off the top and used it to bribe Richard Nixon. So, so the Democrats weren't interested, but the Republicans said, cross my palm with cash, I'll take whatever you've got. And that flood of cash brought Ronald Reagan into office. And Reagan's first job was to defund the Democratic Party, destroy the funding base for the Democratic Party. 
which meant destroy the unions. And he declared war on Patco in one week, he took down one of the only two unions that had actually endorsed him for president. They thought they had a deal with him. And in this, he was following the model of his role model, Margaret Thatcher, who two years earlier had done the exact same thing with the largest and most powerful um, union in the world, arguably, or certainly in the United Kingdom, which was the coal miners. Union. She destroyed them. It was a much longer process, but it, it worked. And Reagan was so successful in doing this in the 12 years of the Reagan and Bush administration, they wiped out of almost half of the union, unionization of, of America that in 1992, Bill Clinton had to go hat in hand. He and Al Fromm created this thing called the DLC so that they could funnel corporate money into the Democratic Party. He had to go hat in hand to the bankers and the insurance companies. The deal that they came up with they, that they thought what they would do is we'll take money from the good corporations, tech, insurance, banking, you know, the, the good people. And we'll leave the dirty industries to the Republicans. And the result is that we started moving away from democracy. Neither party was connected to the base any longer. Neither party was connected to the people. Now, as a consequence of the internet and online fundraising, and we, we saw this demonstrated with the Obama campaigns, the Clinton campaign, the Bernie Sanders campaign, and most recently the Joe Biden campaign, well, and, and Warnock and Ossoff in Georgia. Now we're back to a situation where average people can fund a political candidate for national office and do. And so we can, the Democratic Party is rapidly walking back from that kind of Clinton Obama uh, position, DLC position of, you know, we'll, we'll kind of go along with the oligarchs. And they're starting to directly confront the oligarchs, which is a really good and healthy thing. And we need a whole lot more of it. But as I said, when I started out, we're at a very, very dangerous time. And if the Biden administration is not successful in doing the things that the majority of people want and doing them relatively quickly, we've got about six months here before the primary season begins and all hell breaks loose. And you know, a year and a half until the next election or a little more than that. But so this is such a critical time and it's such an important time for us to be engaged and to be informed, to understand what's going on. Because we're now in our third battle with oligarchy in the United States. We won in 1860, we won in 1930. And if we don't win this time, get ready because the next Republican who becomes president in 2024, the Josh Hawley or Ted Cruz or Tom Cotton is not gonna be a bumbling buffoon like Donald Trump was. They're gonna get their job done and they're going to flip this country into a police state. So uh, with that, uh, I'm not sure, was it Josh? Uh, you're gonna take questions from the audience and toss them to me? No, um, so I'm Shane, I'm an event oh, manager Shane. here at Town Hall Seattle. Yeah, awesome. And you, so Shane. now we're going to transition to audience Q&A. So we invite you, if you're in Crowdcast, you can submit your questions down below using the ask a question button. If you're watching on YouTube, you can submit those in the chat and we will make sure to ask those as well. Um, so our first question um, comes from a youth viewer, actually, Olga Ruminastov. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced that. They ask, how easy is it to tax the billionaires? Well, it's a matter of political will. Um, you know, <laughs> Woodrow Wilson raised the top tax rate up to 91% back in the day. Uh, FDR raised the top tax rate up to 91%. It stayed that way through the through the entire, uh, or through the entire rest of Franklin uh, Roosevelt's administration, through the Harry Truman administration, through the Dwight Eisenhower administration. It was 91% through the entire John Kennedy administration. It was 91% through the, through the uh, entire Lyndon John, well, actually th halfway through the Lyndon Johnson administration. And what we did with that money was we built hospitals and roads and highways and airports and schools, and we educated people and we put men on the moon and we did all kinds of amazing things. America was just like the envy of the world. Lyndon Johnson lowered that from 91% down to 74%, but he closed up so many loopholes that had been drilled in the tax code that it was actually a tax increase on really, really rich people that LBJ did in 1967. And, but, but it lowered it theoretically to, or, you know, to 74%. But that was still high enough that when you hit that tax bracket, people just stopped taking an income. At that point in time, uh, you know, prior to 1980, prior to the Reagan revolution, the average CEO in the United States only took 30 times what their average employee took in wages, because any more than that, and it would, you know, it's confiscatory tax bracket that you'd, you'd find yourself in. And 
that stabilizes countries. If you look at the most stable countries of the world, economically and politically, you find that almost all of them have a top tax rate that's well north of 50%. And uh, you know, when Reagan dropped that down below 50%, and it stayed below 50% ever since, that then produces the bumper crop of billionaires. We now have 700 and some odd billionaires in the United States um, as a consequence of that. So it's a matter of political will. Um, but, uh, you know, again, it may also be a matter of confronting the filibuster if we can't get Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema and maybe a couple of other uh, conservative Democrats who are trying to protect, you know, Manchin's obviously trying to protect the coal law industry in West Virginia and Sinema is protecting the banking industry. Um, uh, and they think they're, you know, it's going to work out for them, but it's going to be a disaster for this country if we don't take down the filibuster. Next. So our next question comes from Barbara and there's a sort of a follow-up. So I'll get to that in just a moment. So Barbara asks, how can we influence progressive millionaires and billionaires to buy media and help build a progressive media infrastructure? And then tying onto that, Caroline asks, or is it possible to have a balanced media and reinstall the fairness doctrine? There's a chapter about that in the book. And, <laughs> um, and I wrote an article for The Nation magazine that kind of rehashes some of it. Uh, a few months ago, in which I suggested, and in fact, I had written an op-ed about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, when Clear Channel was in bankruptcy, and they were for sale for $1.2 billion, and that was like 800 and some odd radio stations, and, and a good chunk of them were running right-wing radio, and I wrote an open letter to Tom Steyer saying, <laughs> you want a place to put your money? Here's where you should put your money. Um, I'm not sure how to lobby them. I've been trying. I, I, I have friends who've been trying. I have friends who know billionaires who've been trying. Um, no nibbles so far, but it's a great idea. With regard to the Fairness Doctrine, the Fairness Doctrine um, really didn't do that much. Uh, you, you know, the Fairness Doctrine um, has been wildly exaggerated by Rush Limbaugh. He's turned the Fairness over the years. He's, he turned the Fairness Doctrine into this boogeyman as if, you know, before the Fairness Doctrine, I couldn't have had a show. Well, it's nonsense. The Fairness Doctrine basically required that radio and television stations, quote, program in the public interest. And the way the FCC interpreted that was that um, television had to carry news, an hour of news in prime time, half hour local, half hour of national. And radio stations carried news at the top of every hour. And that, and, and that was pretty much it. And then there had to be, quote, equal time for opposing points of view. But it was only when those points of view that were being opposed were expressed by the ownership or the management of a radio or television station. I was working in radio back then. One of my first jobs was as a weekend DJ in a country western station when I was 16 years old, 1967, I guess that would be. And, and uh, you know, we had the Fairness Doctrine. And, and when Chuck, Chuck Drake, you know, the guy who was one of the three owners of the station I was on, would come on and do a little, you know, two-minute uh, opinion piece about the new park, you know, the, 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 the bond that the city of Lansing was floating to pay for Potter Park, um, we, you know, my job was to go out and find somebody in the community who would do it, record a two minute rebuttal. But that was because he owned the station. If Rush Limbaugh had been on the station, and in fact, there was opinion talk radio back then. In fact, the biggest opinion talk radio in the country was Alan Berg out of a station in Denver that was blowing a blowtorch signal over 29 states, millions of listeners every day. He was a he was a progressive. And in uh, the mid 1980s, I think it was a year or two before Limbaugh, I'd have to go back and look, they made a movie out of it called Talk Radio. Um, Alan Berg was walking out of the studio and a couple of skinheads walked up with machine guns and blew him away, killed him, assassinated him. And that was, you know, and then there was this pause of a couple of years where there was like basically no national talk radio. And then Limbaugh stepped into that space. Um, but uh, the Fairness Doctrine is no panacea. It's not gonna solve, you know, it'd be nice to have it back because it was a reasonable thing but it's not going to get rid of right-wing talk radio. What we need to do is build a competing media infrastructure. Thank you for that. Uh, so this next question comes from Jim who uh, commented on YouTube and Jim asks, if you could amend the constitution with one amendment, what would it be? It would, it would well, I, I would go for a twofer. I would say <laughs> that money is not speech and corporations are not people. And then uh, this question comes from Dale, also on YouTube. How important is it to end the filibuster? Well, I, I, I hope I've made it clear what I think the stakes are. I, I honestly believe that if we don't end the filibuster, that the Biden administration is going to end up crippled like the Obama administration was by Mitch McConnell. 
and and Mitch McConnell's sitting back there gloating. And uh, he's got now he's got two Democratic senators, Manchin and Cinema, just coming right out and saying, "Oh, we don't think we should get rid of this filibuster. We should, you know, we should let the minority have a say in things." You know, uh, when when Republicans were in the majority, and 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 Barack Obama nominates, you know, uh, uh, Merrick Garland, who, by the way, he, Obama went to Orrin Hatch, the Republican senator from Utah, and said, "Give me the name." of a nominee for the Supreme Court. This is when Scalia died. He said, give me the name of a nominee for the Supreme Court that will be acceptable to Republicans. I want this to be bipartisan. And Warren Hatch said, well, there's this guy, he's a Republican, but he's a good guy. His, his name is Merrick Garland. And he's not, you know, a crazy. So, <laughs> you know, he's got a good reputation. Why don't you take him? And so Obama put forth Merrick, Merrick Garland thinking that Mitch McConnell would be, oh, nice, a Republican, you know, a, a, a kumbaya. No, no, he wouldn't even hold a hearing. Wouldn't even meet him. And 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 Mansion and Cinema think these are the people they're gonna do business with. They're fools. Hmm. Yeah. All right. So this next question comes from Crystal. And Crystal asks, do you know of any grassroots or nonprofit organizations who are who are advocating against oligarchy specifically? How would you suggest we as regular citizens raise our voices or fight for legislation against oligarchy? Is that even possible um, when they buy our representatives? Yeah. Well, uh, move to amend.org has been working for years on a constitutional amendment that says two things, what I said earlier, the corporations are not people and money is not speech. And it's a great organization and I would check it out. Progressive Democrats of America have been fighting the same fight for a long time. Um, they were the first to endorse uh, Bernie Sanders at, 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 you know, in, in the last two primaries and, and they've been doing some great work. Um, pdamerica.org is their website. Move to amend.org is the other website. Um, in some ways, you've got to fight it battle by battle. Um, I don't know of a you know move to end oligarchy organization out there, um, but you know there's there are indivisible is doing great work. Um, I got an email from them today, and they were they were saying we need to get this you know HR one, the good government law that that will get money out of politics, and and it actually you know will if it's implemented. And they were like, if we you know let's get this out here, and you know the filibuster notwithstanding, we'll get it passed. Well, you know that's the kind of thing that you can't pass by reconciliation. It's not a budget item. So if you want to clean up our elections, if you want to stop you know uh, red states from throwing black people off the voting rolls purging the voting rolls like they constantly are doing. Um, if you want to, to, to make uh, mail-in voting uh, you know, more widespread so that, so that a larger number of people can vote, if you want to lower the barriers to, to entry into politics, um, we're going to have to get rid of the filibuster. And kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier, but um, Glenda on YouTube is asking, is there a real chance of reversing Citizens United? Well, you would have to reverse not just Citizens United, but McCutcheon, which followed it in 2013, which eliminated the number of politicians an individual billionaire could own. <laughs> Seriously, they, there, was a, there was a limit to how many politicians one person could own. And they blew that away in 2013. Um, and you'd have to reverse uh, Buckley and, and, uh, and First National Bank versus Bilotti. And uh, yes, uh, the, you know, that, this could be done by constitutional amendment. It could also be done by an act of Congress. And uh, I wrote about this at some length in, in, uh, in my book, uh, The Hidden History of the Supreme Court, the whole last chapter. Um, when, when Reagan was president, the, the two things that Reagan really, really campaigned hard on and was elected on were overturning Brown versus Board of Education, the anti-segregation in schools Supreme Court ruling. Uh, he wanted to overturn that. And he wanted to overturn Roe v. Wade, the, the 1973 abortion ruling, 1954, 1973. And so he hired a young lawyer, real smart guy, you know, very politically active, very conservative, and installed him in the Justice Department and said, your job is to figure out how we can reverse Roe v. Wade and Brown v. Board without a constitutional amendment, because a constitutional amendment requires two thirds of the House and Senate and three quarters of the states, and that ain't gonna happen. And this guy for, worked on this for a year and a half. He went back to the founding of the country. Um, the, the next to the last chapter in my book on the Supreme Court is, de is devoted entirely to this guy and what he laid out. And he, and he pointed out that Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution, Article 3 is the judiciary. 
And section two is the Supreme Court. And Article Three, Section Two of the Constitution. In fact, I have my Constitution right here. <laughs> uh, Article Three, Section Two. If I can find it very quickly, I want to quote it exactly correctly here, because this is really a critical thing. Article Three, Section Two says, um, "The Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction both as to law and fact." In other words, they're the final court of appeals. It's the, this is where the buck stops. With such exceptions and under such regulations as the Congress shall make, period, full stop. In other words, Congress can write a law and say, we are directing the Supreme Court that you may not rule on this. And in fact, this has happened. And in fact, in the 1980s during the Reagan administration, there were over a hundred pieces of legislation introduced into the House or Senate at various times, all by Republicans all invoking this clause as a result of the encouragement of this one particular lawyer who worked in the Justice Department that, that said just that, almost all of them to overturn Roe v. Wade or Brown v. Board. None of them succeeded. They could never get a, a, a large enough vote on any of them. But it is possible, I believe, uh, the, the dean of the, of the Stanford Law School, Larry Kramer, wrote an entire book about this called The People Themselves. And that lawyer, by the way, that Reagan hired, his name was John Roberts. He's now the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. All right, thank you. Um, so our next question comes from Mike. Again, another comment over on YouTube. Mike asks, what's the best way to convince someone that they'll never be a billionaire themselves So stop defending them with fears of death taxes, et cetera? Well, I don't, I don't think we want to <laughs> shatter people's dreams. <laughs> I, I would, you know, to, to those folks who are, uh, you know, what, what's the old joke, you know, Republicans think of themselves as temporarily distressed multimillionaires, Republican voters. Um, you know, what I would instead talk with, and, and what I do when conservatives call into my radio show, um, uh, and what I talk with them about is, how do we create a society that works for all of us, not just for the billionaires? I mean, I don't have a problem with somebody getting rich. I don't have a, a problem with somebody getting filthy rich. I think their taxes should be higher. Uh, but, you know, th that's the American way, as it were. But let's do it in a way that doesn't cause everyone else to get poor. Since the Reagan revolution, and I, according to the Economic Policy Institute, I believe their number was $12 trillion. But there's a definable amount of money that's actually gone out of the pockets of the middle class and into the pockets of the top 1%. And had wages followed productivity since 1980, since the beginning of the Rebel Reagan Revolution, and they had from 1890 until 1980, as productivity went up with automation and things like that, wages went up. Had wages continued to follow productivity, the minimum wage right now would be around 25 bucks an hour. Mm. And over $50 trillion worth of wealth would be in the pockets of the middle class but it's not. Hmm. Yeah. All right, so this next question comes from Madeline. Madeline asks, are you confident that the Dems are being firm enough to get the policies passed which will help the poor and middle class? Is there anything else we can do besides calling Joe Matchin at, at all? Yeah, that has to be job one because as long as the filibuster is in place, anything that challenges oligarchy will be struck down by Mitch McConnell. And, and I mean, it, it literally takes one senator, one Republican senator to, and, and they don't have to stand and speak to do a filibuster. All they have to do is send an email to Mitch saying, I object, or just raise their hand and say, I object. And, and at that point, it's going to take, you know, it's, it's going to take 10 Republican senators to overcome that filibuster if they join with all the Democrats. Mm -hmm. The filibuster, by the way, just for a little background, um, John C. Calhoun was the vice president of John Quincy Adams. Um, they hated each other. It was because the election, that election got thrown into the House of Representatives. And then he uh, intentionally became the vice president of Andrew Jackson, the, the, the guy who called himself the Indian killer. And he resigned from the vice presidency. He's one of only two vice presidents to ever resign from the vice presidency, him and Spiro Agnew. He resigned from the vice presidency because a seat in the, in the US Senate had opened up uh, representing South Carolina, which is where John C. Calhoun was from. And so he stepped into the Senate and he wanted to, uh, and, and at that point, the abolition movement was getting really strong in the North, really strong. And in the House of Representatives, they had actually passed a law 
saying that no member of the House of Representatives could say the words slavery or abolition on the floor of the House. So after John Quincy Adams, uh, John Adams' son, after he who was very anti-slavery, um, after he left the presidency, he ran for the House of Representatives from Massachusetts and won just so every single day that the House was in session, he could go on the floor of the House and demand abolition of slavery. So that was happening in the House of Representatives. Over in the Senate, John C. Calhoun was like this rising powerhouse. He was a very dynamic speaker, a very powerful man. He, he's referred to very often as the father of the Confederacy. And he got the Senate to change their rules so that anytime there was a discussion of abolition or slavery, it would require 66, well, it wasn't, a, there weren't 100 senators at that time, but it would require a, a supermajority, a two thirds vote to, to, uh, to move, you know, for a motion to proceed. In other words, to end the debate and, and go to an actual vote on anything. And that was referred to as the filibuster. John C. Calhoun was the father of the filibuster. The filibuster was used exclusively to fight back against the abolition movement up until the Civil War and after the Civil War and was used exclusively from 1865 until 1964. The filibuster was used exclusively against civil rights legislation. Since 1964, it's been used quite frequently on behalf of the oligarchs, uh, on behalf of legislation that would harm the, you know, basically the ruling class. But that's the history of the filibuster. It's got nothing to do with democracy. I mean, you know, I, I, I hear, you know, Joe Manchin on TV going, well, you know, we've got to worry about the minority. You know, they should have a say. Um, no, <laughs> as, as I said before. Uh, it, it's a it's a it's a vestigial uh, vestigial institution or a uh, an anachronistic institution. It's a leftover of slavery and the and the backlash of of the South against uh, civil rights, and it needs to be done away with. All right. So this is going to be our last question for the evening. Um, Jean asks, how much do you think that the definition of corporate responsibility that is only be holding to the stockholders than anyone else has factored into what you are explaining. It's been huge. And these were parts of the Reagan revolution. When, when Ronald Reagan came into power in, in 1981, it was against the law for a corporation to buy its own stock, which just artificially inflates the stock price by decreasing the number of shares that are outstanding. It was illegal for a corporation to compensate its own uh, senior management with stock because the logic went, well, if you compensate them with stock and you let the corporation buy back its own stock, you know, a guy can give himself, he can be compensated with a million dollars worth of stock. He can buy back enough stock to double the value of the stock. Suddenly he's now got a $2 million compensation. Pay. And that's exactly what's happened, by the way. But Reagan decriminalized these things and changed the rules of the game. So, you know, uh, Really, and, and Elizabeth Warren has, has proposed a lot of these, basically a lot of what needs to be done is simply reversing the Reagan revolution. Uh, and, and ironically, the, the, the marching tune of the Reagan revolution was reversing the New Deal. Um, you know, it seems like we go in these 50 year cycles with regard to politics in America, 40, 50 year cycles. So uh, we need to undo those. And I'll just add one last bonus uh, answer to that um, uh, with regard to Elizabeth Warren's wealth tax. Um, she is suggesting that uh, we should have a 1% or 2% wealth tax on uh, great fortunes, on, on you know, people who have more than a billion dollars in their name. And I think it's important for people to understand what she's talking about. I'm a middle-class guy. Uh, you know, I've done fairly well throughout my life, but you know, I'm basically a middle-class guy. And as that, as with most middle-class people, my largest store of wealth is my home. That's true of the vast majority of Americans, 67% of Americans are homeowners. And, and uh, my home being my money, my wealth, I pay a tax on that every year. It's a tax on my wealth. It's called a property tax. And that wealth tax that I pay as a homeowner pays for the schools, the, the police, the fire, the, you know, the, the local infrastructure. I mean, it, it sustains life in the community. But the principal store of wealth for a billionaire is their money bin. I mean, it might take a different form. It might be stocks or bonds or something. Like that. But, you know, I think we can generically call it a money bin. 
Why is it that I have to pay a you know four or five percent tax every year? I mean, literally the entire value of my house, I have to pay like four percent of all of it every year as a tax, as a wealth tax, and the billionaires, you know, <laughs> down the street don't have to pay a penny on their damn money bill. It just seems and two percent. I mean, that's lower than most property taxes, and property taxes are wealth taxes on property. So you know, uh, spread the meme, please. Mm, yeah. Um, before we conclude for the evening, um, we had an audience member ask um, where they can find the the websites to references that are in the book. So, um, can you provide us with additional resources or or whatnot, um, or if you have your own website? Um... Yeah, the book has. Uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, the book has. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, I think 18 pages of footnotes, <laughs> end notes at the very end. And uh, probably two thirds of them are URLs to make it really easy for people to, to link into. So it's all in the book, everything I've said. Great. Well, thank you, Tom, for being here this evening. And thank you all for tuning in. If you enjoy this event, you can find many more like it on our website, townhallseattle.org. We hope you'll consider making a donation as your support will allow us to continue to provide events just like this one. If you're interested in purchasing a copy of Tom's book, The Hidden History of American Oligarchy, Reclaiming Our Democracy from the Ruling Class, please use the link on this live stream page to purchase through our friends at Elliott Bay Book Company here in Seattle. And finally, thank you again for being here. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you, Shane. Thank you.